I love it. So, um, same deal. This one, right? The last session, we talked a lot about speed development. To the best of my ability, we talked about speed development. We're going to talk more about plyos in this one. It's got an eye towards triple jump, but a lot of this is stuff that you can kind of steal and put wherever you want. Okay, so for me, I'm coming at this from a very triple jump perspective and how I develop triple jumpers, but I, you can put this in a lot of different places. <clears throat> so it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces. If you weren't here the last one, it's important to recognize that I was an English teacher before I was at St. John's and St. Ben's, so there will be an extended metaphor. Be ready for that on the test at the end. Right, um, And then, maybe a few of you heard, I was a film studies teacher, and it's just really important to me that you know that my favorite sports movie is Moneyball. It becomes increasingly clear why as the progression goes on. But, um, you know, I think, again, I spent, year, I spent eight years coaching high school, and now I'm up at St. John's and St. Ben's, and I frequently find that the most interesting stuff that I see is coming from high school coaches, and I'm convinced that um, these certifications, the you know, whatever, I shouldn't say that, they're fantastic governing bodies and they do great coaches' education. But I got way more out of the summer that I spent shadowing Coach Kopp at Mountain View High School. That was, that was everything. That guy's a genius with the way he does stuff. And I would do that again in a heartbeat. And I think a lot of you are probably doing really brilliant stuff and so to be standing in front of you right now, it's a little intimidating, but um, if you have ideas of things that you do, I would love to hear those too. So, um, on that note, here's your overarching metaphor. Last time we talked about toothpaste, right? Which I know sounds confusing if you weren't here last time. This time we're gonna talk about cake, right? And to me, the cake is really important. And if we look at this objective, especially this bottom one, I can write training in which speed, multi-jumps, which is just what I call plyometrics, and technical training develop together rather than to the exclusion of one another, right? I'm a big believer that you gotta be hitting all of those things together if it's actually gonna transfer to the event, right? And to me, that's a lot like cake, right? You can't have cake without frosting. And I know there's someone in the audience right now thinking, well, what about this, 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 this? And I have two things to say to you. One, shut up. <laughs> two, let's never hang out, okay? <laughs> cake has frosting, end of conversation. Um, but if I've learned anything from the great British baking show, it's that I can't frost my way out of a problem, right? If there's a problem with the sponge, Paul Hollywood's gonna let me know, and there's nothing I can do to avoid that, okay? If there's a problem with my plyos, it's gonna show up in my triple jump. If there is a problem with my triple jump, you can bet it's showing up in my plyos. So I need to bring those things along together, and today is very much about that. It's about how do you bring those things along together and leverage the stuff that you're doing off the runway to improve the runway stuff, right? Because bounding can be a very rep-rich activity, but triple jumping is not. Best case scenario, you get about six, right? So we're gonna start off with transfer of training. Those of you that were around before remember me talking about Dr. Anatoly Vonderchuk, who sent out his surveys to athletes all across the world <clears throat> and got information back, and he took that data on all of these tests and then correlated it to jumps performance. Um, these are women triple jumpers because I coach women and I get really mad when I go to presentations and they only talk about what men do. So coaches of men, you can deal with it. Um, and also the lowest level they have here is a 39 foot triple jumper. So coaches of men, they're still kind of in your range here, right? Um, on that note, we do need to do a little projecting backwards with a few things, which becomes clearer once we get some of the graphs up. But remember, there's two ways to read this, right? I can read this going across and see how relevant is a flying 30, so how relevant is absolute speed to a triple jumper as she progresses along her career, right? So here's, a, I don't know, an Olympian. Um, where speed is really important. Remember, the closer we are to one, the stronger the correlation. The further we are from one, right? If we get down below about 0.4, that's a pretty weak correlation. There's, you're sure they're busy, they're doing worksheets, but we're not really sure they're getting better, right? And then the closer they are to negative one, the more we realize we're having the exact opposite effect that we want to, right? So we can read it this way and we can find some things that really change a lot as the athlete gets better. Or we can read it this way 
and go, all right, I have my 12 meter triple jumper who's trying to get to 12 meters 50, where do I need to be placing my emphasis? Right, so there's a pretty good little pace. If we're going back to our toothpaste metaphor, here's where the toothpaste is, right? And if you missed that metaphor, you can watch the video that Coach Anderson is gonna post up on YouTube and it's gonna be awesome because I nailed it, right? Um, so if we break these tests up, we see some of them are speed related and they have to do with the qualities of speed, so absolute speed, acceleration, combination of speed and acceleration. We have some elastic or plyometric qualities. Again, I'll be calling that multi-jumps as we go forward. Standing long jump all the way up to a 10-fold jump from place. A 10-fold jump from place would be if I do a two-leg jump and then I bound right, left, right, left 10 times. Right, so that's measuring how far are you going with 10 bounds to do so. Jump from a short run up, how well does your ability to jump from, we'll say, for this group, probably 12 steps, how well does that correlate to your full approach? And then strength work. So there's a barbell snatch, that's kind of a classic test of power. There's a barbell back squat, which is kind of the classic test of strength, stuff like that. We're not gonna get too into the weeds on it, but I wanna talk about each of those points. So here's our positive interrelationship. Anything above this line is beneficial. Anything below this line is questionable, right? Maybe it helps, maybe there's a good reason to do it. But it's probably not where you wanna say, I'm going all in on med balls, baby, right? Like, it just may not be the biggest place for improvement. So here's your jump from a short run up. It's interesting to note, right? We have a clear trend line. It's starting at 0.7, works its way up to 0.9. I don't know what it does as we follow it off the graph down to our shorter jumpers, but I'm gonna go ahead and guess that it goes down a little more and then it probably levels off or maybe goes down a little more and then spikes back up a little bit, right? Speed test, here's our flying 30, so that's our absolute highest speed that they can attain. Here's acceleration, here is your 60 from blocks and here's your 100 meter sprint. Right, so a little bit more in the speed, absolute speed endurance range. We see maybe some other stuff outpaces that flying 30, but it's the 60, which kind of involves a flying 30 anyway. So absolute speed, acceleration, those things are all kind of interwoven. They're all pretty important to bring along together. Right, multi jumps, here's your standing long jump. Right, you're just one off, leap into the sand pit. How far did you go? Standing triple jump, which is not like a standing right, right, left. It's a standing jump followed by a right, left, land. Okay? Standing five-fold jump is right, left, right, left, left, or right, left, right, left, right, whatever. And then your 10-fold jump, like I said, is a little bit above the rest of them. It starts out at about 0.8, and then it kind of unevenly ticks its way up in importance as time goes on. Here's your strength stuff. Again, as someone like me who dedicated years and lots of money to becoming certified in various strength stuff. This is troubling because a lot of what we do hangs out in the world of not relevant, right? Now, if we project backwards, I'm gonna go ahead and say that this barbell snatch probably trends up a little bit, right? And I'm gonna guess that this barbell back squat probably hangs out right around that 0.35 and then ticks up right here because we see that with most of the other events, right? Barbell or snatch like power tends to be more important and then at a certain point, it crosses with absolute strength and becomes a little less important than absolute strength. My guess is they probably cross right about here around 38 feet, um, but that's a total guess, okay? Um, Here's where I think the most important piece of this is. We wanna look at the relationship between speed, multi-jumps, and short jumps, right? Green is your short jump. Blue is your 10-fold bound. Orange is your flying speed. These are all coming together, right? More than any other event I have ever been around, all of those things travel together. If one of those things gets away from the other, we have a problem. I would say that probably there's a little bit of a gap here where if we travel, if we project backwards, this tenfold bound is probably trending a bit ahead of the rest of them in the early phases of development. Then the other ones kind of catch up and then from there you're off to the races. Okay, 
So all of those have to come together. You cannot develop technique to the exclusion of your multi jumps. You cannot develop your multi jumps to the exclusion of your speed, or you will have uneven parts of your cake, right? The frosting's really thick here, it's really thin there, and I don't know, the judges are gonna tear me apart, right? So here are the progressions that I think about as I'm looking at an athlete. Early technical work should take the form of bounding, and then it should progress to a steady diet of triple jumping, right? But the best triple jump coaches that I have met, especially at the high school level, they are bounding a lot, they are triple jumping a little less. And then somewhere along the development of the athlete, those two cross, right? But they keep kind of bounding and they keep kind of triple jumping the whole way through. Speed, we're focusing on max velocity and acceleration during those early years of development. And we're kind of patiently progressing to speed endurance, right? We're not worrying about um, doing a lot of 120s with this group, full blast 120s, I should say. Um, I'm certainly not worrying a ton about doing 200s at 38 second pace. Right? That's a place where you're spending a lot of energy and you're not getting a lot back. Now, if you have a triple jumper that's doubling on your four by two, well, you probably gotta spend some time in those places, right? Because the demands on this are different than a pure triple jumper. That's a calculation you'll make, right? And that's a calculation you and your fellow, right? So if you're the jumps coach and you have a sprints coach, that's a calculation that the two of you are making probably with your head coach in the mix too. Um, strength. We're focusing on power first. We're focusing on how do you move a load quickly, not how do you take a really heavy load and move that slowly, right? We'll talk about this more in my next presentation in the vertical jumps room. Surprise, surprise, if you move a heavy load slowly, you often just move slowly, right? So at the early levels, that power is where you want it to be. Multi-jump training, as I've already said, but it bears repeating, that is your primary mode of technical development early in a kid's career, right? If they're like, I'm a triple jumper, for the first couple weeks, you are a bounder, <laughs> and we will triple jump later, okay? Because there's no point in triple jumping if you don't know how to bound yet. And then endurance, probably, like I said, of fairly little importance, except if you consider repeated effort endurance, how many jumps can their body endure, right? Can they take six triple jumps in a meet and not fall apart on jump three? Because believe me, I have coached these athletes, right? I mess this up all the time, but I'm working on it. We want to figure out how do they endure and keep getting better throughout a series. <clears throat> so again, we're focusing on elastic ability because especially for us at our level, that's where our energy needs to go, right? Some coach who's got D1 athletes and wants to talk to you all day about like, no, it needs to be this at the board. That's super rad. I'm so proud of you, man. I don't coach a 49 foot triple jumper. So I don't need to work on that, right? I do need to work on that. Not as much as I need to work on bounding. Right? <coughs> and then speed is probably the other bang for your buck thing. But like I said, we're focusing on elastic ability and technique. So here's the piece where triple jump eluded me for years and years and years. This presentation could absolutely be subtitled mistakes John made for everyone okay that's what we're going through essentially is places where I screwed up and where triple jump was really really hard for me having come from a background of like pole vaulting and long jumping the shapes were just kind of the shapes that you made right and those shapes whether you were a 16 foot pole vaulter or a 12 foot pole vaulter they all kind of looked alike not so with triple jump, right? Because we know speed, elastic ability, and technique all travel together. So the expression of that technique changes. This guy was the Australian national pole vault coach and he yelled at me a lot. <laughs> but he says this, and I'll never forget it because I was asking him, I don't know, some stupid question. And he yelled at me and said, John, what's technically desirable needs to be physically possible. You cannot talk your way out of a problem. You cannot cue your way out of a problem if the kid isn't physically capable. And the English major in me said, I will write a paper about how I can talk my way out of a problem, right? Anything's right if I write the paper, right? He didn't like that. So triple jump is where I've seen the clearest expression of this idea. 
The leap triple jump involves very large shapes and very dynamic transitions between them. You see elite, tri elite triple jumpers, their knees up here, they've got this huge split while they're in the air, and then they transition through that off the ground into another shape as they work their way through it. Well, most of us aren't elite triple jumpers, so we're not gonna make those shapes because those shapes, you know, duh, are the result of forces. Large forces create large shapes. Small forces create small shapes. The best example I can think of for this is watching a small child run, right? We've all had moments where we watch a child run and go, oh my God, that kid has a perfect foot strike pattern. Why can't my collegiate athletes use their brains and move like that? Right? And there's a lot of good reasons that they can't, but kids are doing it. They are running really, really well. Watch a kid jump. It is perfect penultimate mechanics. They nail it. Does it look like we conceive of max velocity sprinting? No, because little kids don't have a lot of force at their disposal. So what they do have, they express very, very well, but is a little kid running with their knees here? Absolutely not, because they don't have enough force to hit the ground hard enough for their leg to rebound to that, okay? So that's the piece that's important. That force production capability, that force absorption capability, and that force application ability governs the expression of technique. They all go together. All right, and you're gonna hear that with me, you know, you're gonna be so sick of me saying that by the end of this. Here is a very talented division three woman, probably one of the better, probably the best technical jumper I've ever coached, right? This is her doing a six total step approach into a full triple jump, right? Not a lot of speed, pretty darn strong, um, but not a lot of speed, pretty darn plyometric, but I've limited the speed quality. So the shapes should look different, right? So here we have her coming in. Those of you that were here for the sprint stuff, this shape should look familiar, right? There's touchdown, knees are together, torso is nice and upright, right? This should make be a little tip for her, but we're doing all right. She comes through, there's toe off, nice incomplete extension there, toe under the knee, she's running well. There is first phase touchdown. Right? She's getting ready to bound off that board. It's pretty similar to this one. The foot is flat instead of on the ball of the foot. The shin is vertical. We talked about the importance of that in our last session. And there's some front side distance. The foot isn't right here, mostly under the body. It's out here, slightly in front of the body. Okay? And then she comes off, that toe off, pretty close to the same shape there. We would be looking for a little bit more extension off that leg, but we'll get to that in a minute. So, oh, this is super easy for everyone to see. I'm super <laughs> amped to show you this. Um, down here, this is Will Clay, Olympic silver medalist, doing a full approach triple jump. Lots of speed, lots of force, right? Same shapes, right? Pretty much the same shape, pretty much the same shape. Pretty much the same shape, except a little more front side distance. That foot, instead of being about here, is about here. More speed, right? So we're gonna see now, some shapes stay the same, some shapes get bigger, obviously, right? Coming off here, into our sec uh, through our first phase, getting ready to land our second phase right there, that position looks pretty close to our sprint posture. Right? Knees are together. Torso could be a little more upright. This is something we were working on. Um, shin's pretty vertical. That looks an awful lot like toe off when she's running. There's a nice little split. She's getting ready to bound. There's our touchdown. There's some front side distance with a vertical shin and a nice upright torso. Pretty similar shape here compared to the early part of her, or to her first phase takeoff. Here's our comparison again. Pretty close to the same shape. Same shape, but bigger. Same shape, but bigger split. Same shape, more front side distance. Here we go, second phase into third. <clears throat> Pretty common, right? Nice upright torso, little split of the legs. We've talked about this to death. I'm not gonna hit you with it again. Talked about that. Let's compare it. 
same shape, bigger. Same shape, more front side distance. Same shape, same shape. This shape, completely absent, right? The coiling that he does there, where he kind of tightens everything back up, you need so much time in the air to do that, that for most triple jumpers, there's just not that time, right? So I, I, I've never coached <coughs> someone that's done that. <clears throat> but, so we see that here's our dilemma now. What are the common denominators that don't depend on speed? What are the things that I'm looking for that aren't gonna change so much? Okay, because how do I coach something that I know is going to change as the kid gets better? So here's the first shape that I'm looking for. And we've talked about this one multiple times as we've gone through it. This is our bounding touchdown, right? We've got a vertical shin, we've got a nice hold foot, rolling contact, we've got the shoulders over the hips, and we've got some front side distance, but that front side distance is commensurate to the speed and the plyometric ability of an athlete. If I am insanely strong and plyometric, I can be out here and catch a little deeper position. If I am not insanely strong, I can't catch myself there, right? I'm gonna either buckle or I'm gonna tip forward. So my front side distance is gonna be a little closer, right? That's just survival. Can we see that shape? Take off of first phase, second phase, third phase. Here's a big one for me. High hips, low knees, right? I coached for years saying, oh, you gotta get your knees up, you gotta get your knees up. I don't say that anymore, right? If you hear me saying that, call a doctor because I am not well. I gave that one up, I swore off of it because as I looked at more and more sprinters and more and more jumpers, this knee is never ever higher than the hip. But what does a kid do when you tell them, I need you to run with high knees? I'm doing it, coach, I'm running like this, right? And it gets kind of silly, but the kid's doing what I told him to do, whoops. So I talk about high hips, low knees. I talk about getting that knee forward, right? If the knee's gonna come forward, there's only one way for that ball and socket joint to do that, and that's to bring the knee up to the appropriate height, right? So I'm not yelling at a kid that I want them to run like this. I'm telling them to get the knee forward. It just shouldn't be up here to the detriment of everything else, okay? And you heard me in the last section talk about skips for height. We see this mistake all the time when they skip they mistake getting their knee high for actually jumping up, right? Because I gotta drive my knee. And they do this and they barely leave the ground, right? This is a shape that's huge over and over again. High hips, quote unquote, low knees. The knee should never be higher than the hip. A roughly symmetrical leg angle in flight. And what I mean by that is if I draw a line right down the midline, and then I draw a nice little arc from toe to heel, this should be equal, right? There's roughly symmetry there. This shape is a lot bigger, right? There's more distance between the feet, but there's still symmetry. Same deal here. Here is an interesting example because this is close, but I think if you're in the very front row, you can see it's not quite symmetrical. There's a little bit more on the back than there is on the front. And if we look at her posture, we can see her pelvis has kind of tipped forward and she's gotten a little off balance in the air, right? So that's something that we would probably be working on. We'd be moving further upstream to ask what problem caused that? All right, next one, a long pendular swing of that swing or free leg, right? That leg is going to come down first and then up late, right? In your very first phase, as you come off the board, it's pretty close to running, so it's gonna recover higher, but for every subsequent bound, it's a nice, long, low recovery, right? And this is what we just talked about. If we look at her running off the board, here's touchdown, here's toe off, here's touchdown, pretty similar shape, here's toe off, here's mid air, looks an awful lot like touchdown, mid air looks an awful lot like toe off, right? So this reminds us that that very first phase is somewhere between running off the board and bounding off the board, right? We're not here taking a really aggressive jump, we're keeping it a little flat and we're running off the board and that manifests in the shape that they make right there. 
that first phase has an awful lot in common with running. As she works through there, this is something we talked about a lot. She comes through running, and then she said, all I think about is I wanna set myself up like I'm just taking my next bound. This one gets a little confusing. I hope if it doesn't make sense, somebody stop me, okay? I call this one swing leg retraction. <clears throat> Here's my swing leg as it comes forward, right? We should see, I'm really glad that there's some little arrows there that people all the way in the back definitely can see. Um, we should see that foot coming up and forward at the same time. But a really common error that we're gonna see, especially in the running, is that foot will flick up before the hip starts traveling forward. That's a problem, it's gotta come forward more. So that leg should retract and fold up underneath us. At the same time, this lead leg should be hammering down and back. So we've got this happening at toe off, off the board. This foot is going to recover up and forward <coughs> while this leg drops down and we hit that position running in the air. Now it's important to remember that this one is also commensurate to speed. The amount that this foot folds up is directly correlated to how fast you're going. How quick does the foot need to get in front of you? If I'm just taking little hops, I don't get a lot of swing leg retraction because it's not trying to get in front very fast. It doesn't have a lot of ground to cover. There's gonna be a lot of swing leg retraction if I'm taking a huge bound and I have the strength and speed to handle that, okay? So when we're doing hops and bounds, I never coach a kid to lift that leg and get it forward. I just tell them get it forward and let it organize how much it's gonna fold, okay? Their body will figure it out on its own. The body is smart. I'm just coaching some ideas. And then finally, I think this is the last one, a symmetrical swing leg. So if we look at Right, so the swing leg, you take off, and then it's gonna swing forward, it's gonna recover forward. The amount of distance directly from under the center of mass to the toe is roughly the amount of distance that you're gonna get as it rebounds forward, right? Same deal here, big displacement forward off the board, big displacement forward in the air. So if I'm trying to get them to this position, I'm not telling them I need you to get your knee up. I'm telling them I need you to push off the board more. And then trusting that that backside distance is gonna give me the front side distance that I actually want. So it's a little backwards, but that's been a lesson that I messed up and learned for all of us. So here's where the line gets fine. And we talked about this in our previous presentation a little bit too. If I'm watching the athlete versus cueing the athlete, the thing that I'm looking for, they can't always feel, right? If I want commensurate front side distance, the kid's not, how are, they gonna, how are they supposed to feel that? They can't, right? So I'm over here telling them, I need you to think about a long spine with the chest up. I need high hips, low knees. I need full footed rolling contacts. These are the messages that we're hitting over <coughs> and over again with our athletes. These are the things that I am watching for, but maybe not really talking them because cueing them on swing leg retraction, I might as well tie their shoes together, right? It's just not gonna work. So I view training very much as a constant search for where I can repeat these cues and keep hitting these ideas without doing the same activities over and over again. If I'm sprinting, I can hit long spine, high hips, low knees, commensurate swing leg retraction, whatever. I'm working on that here. I go to bounding. I can work a lot of that same stuff, but now I've got full-footed contacts and a long pendular swing leg. I go to triple jump and we put it together. Each of these things is nurturing the other. It's allowing me to get repetitions without doing the same activity over and over again because that's where injuries happen. When you just do the same thing over and over again and you're surprised that they have an overuse injury. And by you, I mean me, right? So. It's also this idea that you keep your skill coupled with context. And this is why I don't believe in drills very much. A drill is a skill completely separated from reality, completely separated from the 
context that creates movement. And sometimes that can be good. Sometimes the concept is so confusing that we just gotta go do a drill. But then we gotta get that drill back in reality. This is real movement. Drills oftentimes, there's not real speed, there's not real plyometric demands. It looks great in the drill, and then it just doesn't transfer because it's, it's detached from reality. So teaching and training with triple jumper, embedding that technical training off of the runway. So here's what an early season week looks like for me, right? And then when I say this is what it looks like for me, this is if I'm Dean John, placing himself back in the context of it's March 14th, it's go time, right? This is me going, uh, it's go time and I have half of a gym court that I'm allowed to use while baseballs are flying across the other side. What do I do? Well, fortunately, like we just talked about, early triple jump training doesn't need a sand pit. It needs room for you to bound. So I am getting on that basketball court I'm trying to convince the wrestling coach to let me in the wrestling room so we can do some stuff on the mats. I'll, I promise I'll get that little whatever the squeegee thing going and we'll, we'll get it really clean by the end. We won't. Please. Right? So early on, if you don't know what some of these things are, that's fine, we're gonna talk about it. Monday, if I'm training three days a week, I've got short horizontal bounds, then I've got remedial vertical bounds, and then maybe I'm doing some in-place jumps. This week, I've got short horizontal bounds and then I'm choosing whether I'm doing some remedial vertical bounds or if I'm doing in-place jumps. One of the things that I bear in mind as I'm designing this kind of training is I'm asking myself, how much time does my athlete need to recover? Okay? One of the examples that a mentor once told me was he used the metaphor of, and again, former English teacher, love me some metaphors. He said, if I'm riding my bike and my phone goes off and I, whoa, uh, and I, stop paying attention, I go into the ditch, hopefully I had my helmet on, I wake up with maybe a bump on my head and I'm okay and I get back up and I keep riding. If I'm driving a Ferrari 100 miles an hour and I get distracted and go into the ditch, I'm at least doing some time in the hospital. If an athlete is a Ferrari, they accumulate shocking amounts of internal damage when they do a workout and they just need more time to recover. If an athlete is a bicycle, right? If an athlete is your huffy, <laughs> okay, come back the next day and let's do it all again, right? They just didn't accumulate that much damage. That's why little kids can play so hard day after day after day. But if you try to keep with your five-year-old, you are dying the next day, right? It's just a bigger engine. It does a little more damage. So here are my short horizontal bounds, right? Essentially, I'm picking activities with no more than five total takeoffs, right? And then I'm, I'm taking that and I'm going, all right, we're gonna take a combination of acti those activities and we're gonna do somewhere between 30 and 70 total takeoffs, right? Your kids that are brand new, they might just be doing those double leg exercises and we might be working on this standing triple jump where they go right, left, and then land in the sand. Right? Your more advanced athletes, we might start doing this double-double, right, right, left, left. But we're working on good whole foot contacts. You'll notice the rolling heel-to-toe action. We're working on high hips and low knees. That knee doesn't come up higher than the hips ever. And that's what this girl primarily works on, is splitting and keeping the knee low because she loves to be here and it messes with her. We've got this long pendular swing leg. We've got good range of motion through the arms sometimes. Right, but we're getting there. She's nailing a lot of this. And we're not triple jumping and we're getting 30 to 70 contacts. That's a rep rich environment for them to work on. Are you yeah. talking contacts like each jump or like each time they do an exercise? Like uh, each jump. So right, if I'm doing a standing triple jump, that's one, two, three. That's three contacts. All right, so this next one, for me, anytime I've got a new kid that is learning how to kind of bound and move, this is where I'm putting them. And you'll notice this is a huge group of women. Most of these are not triple jumpers, right? But this is such a good activity for teaching you how to prepare for the ground and rebound that our sprinters do it, our long jumpers do it, our triple jumpers do it, pole vaulters do it, everyone does this, okay? Um, this is a tough one because most of this we have rolling heel to toe contacts. 
when we're going backwards, we're asking toe to heel, right? If you're, like if I'm coaching high school and it's an early week and I'm not sure who my triple jumpers are, if I see someone that can nail this repeated backwards coming off their heel, I want that kid. You're coming with me, right? And then you're gonna fight with your sprint coach because they want them to. And then we're gonna talk it through and we're gonna share, I hope. Um, or you're gonna win. <laughs> but essentially, we're looking for this free leg to be nice and long in front of the body. You'll notice the triple jumper when she comes through because all of a sudden you'll see one kid who's got a long pendular swing leg. Right? Really easy place for her to start working on that. That's pretty low consequence. <laughs> they might crash into each other. I don't know. Things happen. Um, but uh, bu -bu -bu. we'll also talk about this idea of brace and bounce. One of the most common mistakes that I see with athletes is they come in and they're so excited to get to the ground, probably because they're off balance and they're about to fall, so they want to catch themselves, is they don't wait for the ground, they just go for it, right? So we talk a lot here about you got to wait for the ground to come to you. You brace while you're in the air and then you attack that last inch, right? That's what we're talking about, and this activity is phenomenal. This girl's a really great jumper too, and she nails the backwards um, rolling heel, toe to heel. That girl fell off the mats. <laughs> Things happen, right? Um, because this is a group that, you know, they're not all jumpers, but they're all getting something out of this. This is a great one because it teaches them how to move from the hip. You've completely taken the ankle joint out of the equation because they have to move laterally. And then this cue at the very bottom is my favorite. Don't let your toes touch the ground. It makes them think, how do I spring off of the ball of my foot rather than being right here on my toes the whole time, which is just shin splint city, right? How do I keep my toes off the ground and move off the ball of my foot? Do you ever do this without shoes? Sometimes. Um, if I have athletes that have kind of more of a background where they've been barefoot more, absolutely. Um, if I have a kid whose arches I know collapse um, and kind of has chronic ankle like dumping and val like valgus issues, we'll keep our shoes on. But that's a great activity and that actually leads me into um, this next one. You can tell I procrastinated and didn't have any athletes to demo this, so I had a really hard day. <laughs> um, but these in place circuits are fantastic because especially Remember a second ago, I said, I don't really like to have my jumpers run a lot of repeat 200s. Well, in place of that, we do a circuit of this, right? It gets them lots of jumping contacts. It gives me a chance to let them work on the same ideas of, you know, we'll talk about be the super ball, not the tomato. If you drop a super ball on the ground, it doesn't deform very much, and then it bounces right back up. If you drop a tomato on the ground, it deforms a bunch and it just goes splat, right? So we talk about be strong, as you hit the ground, contact the ground with the back of the ball of your foot, not on your toes, right? Attack the last inch, max height with minimum ground contact time. This gets them exposure to a lot of different kinds of jumping in more of a circuit-based mentality, or yeah, activity, where it's maybe 15 seconds on, 30 seconds off. They can get some good fitness out of that. And it's gonna be a little more beneficial to them as jumpers than repeat twos and threes and fours, right? I was so miserable at that point. <laughs> really feeling my fitness. Um, so, and then I guess the other thing that's great about this is it's got lots of different directions of movement and joint angles, which when you're in high school, you just can't get enough of that, right? If I do my rudiment over and over again, it's great, but this one's got a little more variety, so different kids, I might have to do different things. So let's talk about drills just for a second here. Because there are some things that I have a tough time bounding my way into teaching, right? So like we said, technique, bounding, speed, they all come together. I gotta do some technique stuff that's a little separated. And what I'm gonna show you is what to me has been one of the greatest kind of drill sequences I've ever used. Because it gets them technique without beating the crap out of them, right? And I got this from Joe Vardis, one of the jumps, or the jumps coach at St. John's University. And I do this with my women all the time, right? Your first phase takeoff is rolling and then the shin tips and then you push late, 
right? And this will repeat in a second. So I'm gonna talk about some other stuff and it'll come back. But when I'm talking about triple jump takeoff, previously I talked about be the super ball, right? Brace and bounce. First phase, we talk way more about squish and push, right? I need you to come into the board. I need you to let that shin tip. And then I need you to push yourself forward because we've all seen the kid who goes way up on their first phase and then crashes into their second phase. And that's almost always simply you jumped up too much in your first phase. You've got to flatten it out and you got to run through that board, right? So I'm just going to back up a slide and start at the beginning. So here she comes down, it rolls over. She went up a little bit too high that time. So we said, all right, let's do better. She comes down, it really rolls over. And then she extends late. And we talk about, I need you to feel your hips in front of the board while your foot is still in contact with it, right? That one, she maybe popped up a little much. We're working on it. But then we just transition that straight into a nice low impact way to work on, I create backside distance here, which then creates front side distance there into a nice second phase. So I can, oh, my kid comes in and, oh, my shins are killing me today, coach. Get a box, get a pad. Let's do this on the pole ball pit. Right? I'm sure the pole vault coach isn't going to care. Fortunately for her, the pole vault coach is me. But <laughs> you might have a tougher battle on your hands. But this is huge for me. Right? If I had to pick one drill that kind of like made a difference, it's this one. Everything else is I'm teaching with bounding is built in. So here's what my mid-season week looks like. We've got multi-jumps. We've taken the form of extended bounds now. We've got our meet this day. If you remember back to last time, we talked a little bit about like, all right, I've got my triple jumper. I don't have time for a speed day in here. So I'm sliding, you know, we're, we're in the 100 and we're finding a way to work her into a jumper's four by one or something, right? So that right here, we're getting some touches on that speed. She came down the runway a bunch of times. She touched some speed there. She did a 100 and a four by one. She touched some speed there. We're getting faster. Even if we weren't quite able to practice it that week. Um, and then again, say your meet is Saturday. Well, now I've got time to do some max speed work. So I'm gonna take her out of the 100 and the four by one, and we'll do some speed on this day instead. Right? Here, short horizontal bounds or rudiment. Here, extended bounds or depth jumps. And I have the depth jumps on there with the caveat that I never do these. Right? Maybe you've got a really special kid that needs something like that, but for me, I wait until I'm having a really hard time getting their tenfold bound test further before I use that last trump card, right? If their tenfold bound test is getting better and better and better, I don't see any point to use that, right? For those of you that were in the last presentation, I'm leaving the toothpaste right there in the tube and I'm gonna press on that later when I know it's hard for me to get results doing other stuff, okay? So my short bounds now are progressing to more complicated patterns. We're doing right, 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 left, left, left. We're getting some swing leg retraction there. We're getting some nice pendular action. We're going to some double doubles. So right, right, left, left. We're going to just right, left, right, left. We're just getting a good amount of contacts, right? Same deal, 30 to 70 contacts. But for these complicated patterns, I might cheat a little closer to 30 to 50, okay? It's just a bit of a beating to put on your kid on day one of the week if I'm gonna go after that with 70 contacts. So the stimulus comes from more complicated patterns, not from more volume, all right? Here is a video, I'm gonna start it in a second. This, again, this is the girl from earlier. I love this video because you can see partway through she figures it out, right? So what we're doing with our extended bounds is we're building on the work established with our remedial bounds. If in my remedial bounds I'm doing some one foot hops and it looks good, Maybe I'm covering a foot and a half per jump or per bound. Now I tell them, all right, it usually takes us, let's say 10 bounds to go 10 meters, right? Now I say, I want you to open up that bound a little further and let's see where 10 bounds puts you. Most of the time it might put them closer to 15 or 20, right? They're doing the same number of bounds, but the bounds have gotten a little more intense. So, um, and then you're just kind of allowing greater range of motion, there might be a little more swing leg retraction, and you're still demanding 
good upright posture, good rolling contacts. You can see here, I pulled back on the reins and said, I know you can bound further than that, but you need to show me heel to toe contacts. So she just did little ones. This is the video right here. She's a little leaned forward. She's kind of doing what I would describe as like a donkey kick. She's not long and pendular. She's just booting it backwards and it's knocking her down. And then right here, she finds it. Now she's more upright. Now it's a long pendular swing leg. And now there's just little bits of swing leg retraction as the leg comes forward. So it's this perfect environment for her to get a lot of reps. Right? Here's a right, right, left pattern. So it's just her triple jump over and over again. Low knees, long pendular swing leg, a little bit of swing leg retraction. She's just working on it. Right? Is she covering a lot of ground? Not yet, but she will. And when she does, that triple jump is going to explode. Um, so these are my three favorite extended bound workouts. This one right here, I love that one because that's very triple jumpy. These ones right here, I like them. If I need to take it down a notch, maybe I'll give them something like this. But my long jumpers are rocking these all day. Right? But this repeated lefts, repeated rights, repeated right, left, right, 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 left, right, right, left, or left, left, right, left, left, right, or these double doubles and these extended bounds um, or alternate bounds. Jumpers eat that up. They love it. Right? And I'm just sitting there watching it pulling back on the reins if they get so aggressive that they're losing their posture or they're reaching with their toes. But other than that, I'm letting them kind of open it up, start playing with what they can do. And they're getting a very rep rich activity there, right? How many takeoffs are they getting? How many practice shots do they get figuring out front side distance when they're doing two rounds of this for 20 meters each, right? Hundreds. If they're just doing technique triple jump work, 30. Maybe. So here's my mid-season <coughs> technical work. And those of you that were here, this is redundant and I apologize, but plan on three meets of troubleshooting, right? First one's the one where they can't find the board. Second one's the one where they foul the big one. Third one's the one where they get a tiny little PR, but there's a glimmer of something more hanging out there. Then I'm going big, right? If I wait too long to go big, can't blame them for getting brand new on me at an important meet, right? So I work my way backwards. Remember, the goal is get them to 12 steps. And when it comes to technique, just get them to a B minus and move on, right? They will get it. They will put it together. But if I hang out at six steps until I see perfection, I will never see perfection, right? You cannot get stronger by lifting the same weight over and over again. You need to go a little heavier so that the body can struggle. Adding more speed creates just a little bit of struggle, right? This first day at eight steps, it's about a C minus and that athlete is mad as hell because God darn it, I can do this. And we struggle and we struggle and we get it to a B minus and that athlete is still mad as hell. <coughs> they go home all weekend and they're just angry. But then they come back and eight steps is just suddenly better because their brain had some time to think on it, assuming they were able to get some sleep that weekend. And it just works. This struggle, that's the day you got better. That's the day you moved the bigger weight, but barely. Right? So I'm letting them struggle. I'm saying we're going to get it to a B minus and then we're moving on. And I am not falling off schedule here. Right? If I got to burn some kind of a day somewhere else, I'll do it. If I've got a meet right here, we are jumping eight steps on that meet day. Right? And we'll get a bunch of full jumps in warm up and we'll get a bunch of full jumps in the meet because we're trying to get those reps and I'm not gonna move them to full approach before they're ready because that spells disaster. But I also know I need a lot of reps, right? I do say drill as needed for some conceptual learning and then you'll notice right here, I'm saying practice short approach, right? And the group that was there previously heard me say, or was here previously heard me say it. Once I move to full approach in meets, I do not touch full approach again in practice, right? It is too intense to recover from, but it's not intense enough to transfer to the meat. Because ultimately, without that adrenaline, they're sitting there going like, I, I, it just doesn't feel the same. The, it, the flow is different. They're right, it is. So I do very short approach stuff. And I let that be a place where I rehearse communication and maybe I do a couple drills as needed. Maybe we get the box out and we go over the pole vault pit. Okay? 
here's my main comp cycle. Um, again, this is kind of how I would work it. Maybe we're slipping a little speed work in on this day. Maybe we're here and we've got to meet this day. But what you start noticing, again, I feel bad for people that weren't here last time, but water and whiskey. I have my hard days, I have my easy days, I don't have a lot of stuff in between. Because the stuff in between is hard enough to mess you up, but not easy enough to recover from. So, when we look at multi-jumps here, you'll see that I've said sports-specific choices. Right? This is the section of the season where you get to be creative. <laughs> right? The cake is baked. You are frosting now. Right? If you didn't do multi-jumps and they got brand new on you here, oops, can't frost your way out of that problem. You just can't, right? You can do your best, but at this point, this is where you're doing some very sports specific stuff, right? You're letting the intensity come down. Maybe you do some occasional intense stuff, but it's carefully planned because you know the intensity is coming from your meets. Right? If you do a full meet triple jumping, it's pretty tough to feel good the next day. It's pretty tough to feel good two days later. So this is where I also sprinkle in this idea that eh, variety for variety's sake isn't actually a bad thing. Maybe instead of short horizontal bounds, you do some hurdle hops. Probably pretty low hurdles just to be safe, right? But let's just do something different. Let's stimulate your brain and get you thinking about jumping in a little different way, right? Get creative and keep them interesting. So maybe you're bounding on and off of low boxes. Maybe you've got some cones set up and you're just saying, hey, I want you to bound past the cone for this and then I want you to, you know, whatever. Maybe I want you jumping over the cones. Maybe I want you doing a run into a bounding pattern. Be creative, play with it, keep them interesting. Because at this point, right, it's May and they're kind of, they've, they've been bounding a lot and they're kind of tired of it, right? Physically and mentally. I like to keep some stuff consistent, so that rudiment, I keep it in there because I like it as a movement screen, because I can watch that, and if I know a kid tends to bounce about this high when they're feeling fresh, and I see them not bouncing that high, I gotta pull, I gotta pull back, I gotta relax, and they gotta recover because something's wrong, right? If I'm doing that and I see them bouncing out the ceiling, sweet, let's chill and let's get to a meet, you know? I don't know, let's, let's not break what's clearly working. So I'm working on that. Again, here are my main comp um, technical considerations. I'm avoiding that neural confusion of doing full approaches in practice. I'm making it very short so that they are distinctly different, right? I'm practicing reduced intensity stuff and we're rehearsing the communication. Can we talk through what we will likely be talking about at the meet? Can I get you to link into a feeling that I want you to feel from your full by doing some short approach stuff, right? And then we go to the meet and remember, hey, that thing we talked about with hip pressure, do that. And they're like, okay, I know what to do. I know what that feels like, right? So we're rehearsing the communication. And then this one's a big one for me. If the competition jump looks sharp, we might not even need to triple jump in practice. Honestly, I've let that go so many times. Like, let's just do a little bit of bounding, let's mess around with the hurdles, and let's get to a meet. Because you're ready. I'm not gonna like, oh, everything looks sharp. Let's go for it, okay? I went for it in practice, and then I was shocked that they didn't do well in a meet. Like, that's on me. Um, and so, keep the sprints sharp, keep the multi-jump sharp, triple jump technique will come from there. And then, again, this is a repeat from the previous session, but, I love this cycle because I grew up, or I came of age coaching in Minnesota at the high school level. I've got these three workouts that I'm trying to get in every 10 days, right? So if I had planned on doing my max velocity day on Thursday and then a storm blew in, okay, I'll move it to Friday, done deal. Or if I had planned on doing a max velocity day on Tuesday and then a meet got rescheduled from Tuesday to Monday, Okay, recovery day Wednesday. I'm gonna go after that workout on Thursday. Things happen and we need to be flexible and you have the ability to be flexible if you just think about it as here I have three key days and I got a 10 day window to get through that. Allow yourself the dignity to not work, <laughs> right? 
it's okay. Let them recover. Um, and this is, like I said, a big part of how I sharpen kids up for championships. I know what I need them to do. And so what I'm doing is, all right, we got 10 days here. I got this and this kid kind of is dealing with some, some shin issues. So we're gonna get this day and we're gonna recover. We're gonna fool around with the med ball or come off the box in the pole ball pit until those shins feel better again. And then we're gonna go for day two, right? So that shin splint example is a great thing of like, ah, I know, I just know what I need to do if I'm rehabbing an athlete, right? What is her rhythm? What can she do? And how long does it take her to come back from that? Allow yourself the flexibility to allow the kid to recover. They'll thank you for it. <laughs> Right? Early season training is great because who the heck knows what's gonna happen any day here in Minnesota. And then, again, I love that just learning the rhythms of 